In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we take up Return to Tomorrow. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Episode 49, Return to Tomorrow. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode Return to Tomorrow, which aired on February 9, 1968, and occurred on start date 4768.3. Story synopsis. The Enterprise received a distress call from a planet hundreds of light years too distant to have been visited by any Earth ship. Spock determines that the planet is similar to Earth, but older, and also that the atmosphere was ripped away a half a million years ago. Spock also detects no sign of life. As the Enterprise nears the planet, a voice identifying itself as Sargon asks Kirk to assume a standard orbit around the planet. The voice also addresses the crew of the Enterprise as my children. Spock detects a power source originating 100 miles below the planet's surface, and Kirk and McCoy prepare to beam down. Kirk wants Spock to stay on board, but the Enterprise loses all power when he states this. When Kirk changes his mind and proposes to bring Spock along, all power comes back on. Astrobiologist Dr. Ann Mulhall also tags along, claiming she has received an order to accompany them, despite the fact that Kirk has given no such order. Strangely, the security guards get left behind when the transporter is activated. Furthermore, after arriving, the communicators function through 100 miles of rock, despite the fact that they should not do so. The landing party discovers evidence of an ancient culture on a planet whose habitable surface was destroyed long ago by a self-inflicted cataclysm. Sargon reveals as a spherical receptacle containing pure energy, which is the essence of Sargon. Sargon reports that his people colonized galaxies 6,000 centuries ago, and that humans and Vulcans may be their descendants. When Kirk asks Sargon how he can help, Sargon occupies Kirk's body. The transference process puts great stress on Kirk's body, causing McCoy to become alarmed. Sargon then asks to borrow the bodies of Spock and Anne Mulhall for the surviving minds of Felisa, his wife, and Hanok, a member of the opposing side in the Great War, the only other two survivors, so that they may construct androids. Kirk, Spock, and Mulhall voluntarily agree, and their receptacles are beamed aboard the Enterprise for the transference. As before, the stress is too great on the human bodies, although Spock's body provides to be rugged enough to sustain Hanok temporarily. Sargon leaves Hanok in charge of formulating a metabolism depressant, but Hanok takes the opportunity to doctor the formula to kill Sargon, and thereby Kirk, so that he can stay in Spock's body. Nurse Chapel notices the formula is incorrect, but Hannah erases her memory, and she forgets noticing this. When he is possessed by Hannah, Spock flashes uncharacteristic smiles on several occasions. Hannah finds Felicia is also desirous of keeping her body and does not wish to return to her receptacle. Meanwhile, Sargon is feeling the effects of the incorrect serum, and even Dr. McCoy cannot save him from dying in Kirk's body. Felicia attempts to engage McCoy in her scheme to remain in Mulhall's body while pretending to leave it, but then relents. Sargon, who reveals himself to be alive, expresses his approval. He and Felicia now scheme to force Hanok to leave Spock's body. They restore Kirk to perfect, perfect health, but destroy the receptacle containing Spock's consciousness in order and attempt to administer a deadly poison. Hanok takes control of the ship, but Nurse Ch- Chapel managed to, to inject him, and it turns out that Sargon has been sharing consciousness with Nurse Chapel, and that the hypo only actually contained a tranquilizer. Spock is therefore returned to perfect health, but Hanok, who fled Spock's body, believing it to have been poisoned, is now destroyed. Sargon realizes that the temptation for he and Felicia to abuse abuse their godlike powers is too great, and he and Felicia desert their bodies and fade into oblivion. So what's the fun fact? This is the second time a reference is made in Star Trek, the original series, to the Apollo Moon program, which uh, was 
concluded, or rather, it was a year and a half before the first lunar landing, yet Kirk asked McCoy in this episode, did you wish that the first Apollo mission hadn't reached the moon? Well, the first Apollo mission which reached the moon was Apollo 8 in December 1968, some 10 months after this was episode was aired. However, the Apollo 11 astronauts were the first to reach the moon on July 20 uh, after the show was canceled. Kirk's next comment on going on to Mars and then the nearest star seems to suggest he is referring to the Apollo 11 mission. One of the interesting things about this episode was the controversy over religion. Writer John T. Duggan wrote the original script of this episode after he read an article about highly sophisticated robots. In his original draft, Sargon and Talasia continue their existence as spirits without bodies floating around the universe. However, Gene Roddenberry, who did an uncredited rewrite on the script, changed the ending to the aliens fading out into oblivion. This led Dugan using his pen name of John Kingsbury. Dugan's explanation was that the line totally went against my philosophy and cosmology, and I did not want to be associated with it. The oblivion idea is Roddenberry's philosophy, not mine. That might be a small thing, but I have a reputation in philosophy, and everybody knows me, knows what I stand for, and I certainly do not stand for oblivion in the afterlife. When you write a script, you don't expect to have your worldview changed by a producer. The biggest change in the script by Roddenberry was the episode's philosophy. The line about Sargon's speculation that, quote, your own legends of an Adam and an Eve were two of our travelers. So this line was found to be sacrilegious and offending to Christian viewers. So that led to the line from Dr. Animal Holland that our beliefs and our studies indicate that life on our planet Earth evolved independently which had to be inserted into the script. So it was uh, somewhat an interesting debate, both internally and with NBC censors, about some of the religious aspects of this episode. So what are the uh, three compliance takeaways? Well, uh, this was a fascinating episode, and it really uh, exposed and allows me to explore the issue that high risk can meet high reward. Uh, putting these aliens in the human bodies and that of Spock put the bodies at risk, but the potential knowledge they thought they could gain was so great that it was deemed worthwhile. If you think about that in terms of business, when you make a high profit, it's because there was a high high risk and you were able to manage that risk successfully. In the FCPA world, that high risk forces around bribery. So if you're in a high risk jurisdiction, what's your risk management strategy? Which leads to the next point. What's your risk management protocol? Simply because something is highly risky does not mean you cannot do it. It simply means that you have to deliver a more robust risk management solution. That risk management solution can be more costly. It can be more time-consuming. But if you manage it properly, then uh, you have the opportunity to potentially garner and reap the benefits of high reward. So uh, they're all sort of tied together, leading to my next discussion point for today, which is how do you account for changing risks? The risk in this episode certainly evolved. Uh, Hanok uh, showed himself quite early to be not someone trustworthy and had no intention of going back into his receptacle. Yet even Felicia uh, found uh, the opportunity or rather the temptation to use her godlike powers on the humans so great. So how do you account for changing risk in a robust risk management reporting, and accounting system. Tomorrow, we take up the episode Patterns of Force. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. Thank <laughs> you.